Hello and good evening. My name is Dr. Kathy Liddell and I'm the director of the Law Faculty Centre for Law, Medicine and Life Sciences here at the University of Cambridge. And on behalf of our centre uh, and the Cambridge Science Festival, I would like to welcome you warmly to the 2021 Baron Delancey Lecture, which I'm delighted to say will be given by Dr. Silvia Camparesi, who you can see on the screen, I hope. Also on screen is Dr. Jeff Skopek, the Deputy Director of the Centre. We are very fortunate and grateful that the lecture series is supported by the University's The Hayden Delancey Fund for Medical Law Research and Teaching. And before we get to tonight's main event, I will just take a few minutes of your time to introduce the proceedings. The fund was bestowed by a foundation in Jersey, which was set up in 1970 in memory of the extraordinary Baron Verhaden de Lancey, who was a doctor, a lawyer, and a financier, amongst other achievements. We are delighted that two trustees from the foundation are online tonight, Dr. Charlotte Ritter and Dr. Bas van Uverkirk. Dr. Ritter is in fact a descendant of the Baron's family, and it's, it's wonderful to have this ongoing connection. The Baron's lecture has a, a long history of distinguished speakers, by way of example, James Badenoch QC spoke in 2016 about an important legal development for informed consent and medical negligence. We also had Professor Sir Peter Lockman speak about regulatory burdens for pharmaceutical innovation. And Professor Glenn Cohen from Harvard Law School spoke on the myriad of ethical issues raised by emerging reproductive technologies. In 2019, the last Baron de Lancey lecture before the pandemic, Professor Imogen Gould examined decision-making powers of parents and the courts for very ill young children. Tonight, our subject continues this fascinating list, and Dr. Camparisi will be talking about international sports regulations that require people with different sexual development to take testosterone-lowering drugs before competing in women's middle-distance running events. The regulations apply narrowly to people with different sexual development based on genetic traits that include double X or XY chromosome and hormone production such that they develop as a woman, yet have unusually high levels of testosterone for a woman. But despite the narrow drafting, the regulations have wide implications for the concepts of female sex and gender and empowerment of women in sport. The issues are also particularly topical in view of Casta Semenya's appeal last month to the European Court of Human Rights and her hopes to compete in the Tokyo Olympics later this year. Other athletes also in the frame, in the last Olympics in Rio in, in 2016, all three medalists in the women's 800 metres reportedly had hyperandrogenism. So we are very pleased that Dr. Camparesi has agreed to give this lecture. Sylvia is based at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London, where she specialises in medical ethics and has a special interest in the ethics of sports. Our friend Professor Bartha Knoppers from McGill University was originally scheduled to speak, but unfortunately due to an injury this wasn't possible. So it was simply marvellous that Sylvia was available. Coincidentally, both Sylvia and Bartha are expert advisors on the WADA ethics group. That's the World Anti-Doping Agency's ethics group. Before I hand over to Sylvia, I will just run through a few logistics for this year's online format. Sylvia has kindly pre-recorded her presentation to avoid any technical hitches. This will be broadcast into the same window we are currently watching. So please stay tuned. There is no need to switch to another web page. The changes uh, will happen automatically. And after the presentation, Sylvia will join us also automatically for a live Q&A session facilitated by my colleague Jeff and herself. And this will run um, up until 7 p.m., depending on the questions that you have. And talking of that, we get to an important message about audience participation. During Sylvia's presentation, please feel free to submit questions and comments uh, by typing them into the box below the video stream and clicking the green Ask button. These will then be visible uh, to the entire audience. Uh, please, therefore, ask questions respectful of an audience with diverse backgrounds. And if someone else has submitted a question or comment that you would also like to see Sylvia discuss, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up button to the right of the question. Naturally, an online event wasn't our first preference for tonight's lecture, but this degree of audience participation is a silver lining, so please do use it as fully as possible. 
And with that, I'd like now to pass proceedings on to the pre-recorded video. Hello, and thank you for the invitation to deliver the 2021 Baron de Lancy Lecture. I'm delighted to, to be your speaker today and to talk about low hormones and sport, 11 playing field. This is a research that I've been working on since 2009. Before I start talking about low hormones and level playing field, let me tell you a little bit about me. I'm a bioethicist. I have an interdisciplinary training in biotechnology and philosophy of medicine. My personal interest in track and field led me to a professional interest in ethics and sport. I grew up in Italy, where I was a middle distance runner. I was trained as a biotechnologist before switching to bioethics. And I work in a gene therapy lab as International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in Trieste. The gene therapy lab where I was working had funding from the World Anti-Doping Agency to develop animal model of gene doping. And this is what led me to an interest in bioethics because I started the wondering about the implication of uh, gene transfer applied to for enhancement purposes. Since 2010, I've been based at King's College London in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. In 2012, I was a volunteer at the London Olympics, continuing from my personal, my personal interest in track and field. And since then, uh, I've been working on issues related to ethics uh, and law in medicine and sport. So today, what I want to do in this next 45 minutes or so is provide an overview of Castor Semenya legal case, unpack the notion of unfair advantage in sport, and discuss the legacy of Semenya's case for international sports regulation and the construction of categories in sport. Let's start from the very end before I go to the beginning is that until recently I thought and uh, I would write that about the legacy of Castor Semenya considering a case, a legal case to be completed. But in February, uh, at the end of February of this year, Castor Semenya appealed to the European Court of Human Rights. So we might very well hear more about this case. Um, anyhow, for now, we don't have the details of the case. Uh, we only know that uh, it's the same legal firm from South Africa uh, that uh, worked with her in the appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, for sport is supporting her case. So let's go back to 2009, flashback to when it all started. It was August and we were at the Berlin World Track Championship, and this is when Kasser Zemenia, 18 year old middle distance runner from South Africa, won the gold medal with more than a two second margin over the silver medalist from Kenya, Janet Guzenye. And um, her performance of uh, 1 minute uh, 55 seconds um, and 45 meant that she, was, she had more than a two second margin. And this prompted the um, suspicion of uh, doping, or in her case, it led to a gender investigation. So her medal was revoked shortly afterwards, after her victory in Berlin, and Kasser Semena was banned for competing for 11 months during the investigation into her gender. At the time, fellow athletes, including uh, Elisa Cusma Pizzone from Italy, who finished sixth at the final where Castor Semenya won the gold medal, wrote, uh, and uh, Lisa Cusma Pizzone has been widely cited, this kind of people should not run with us. For me, she's not a woman, she's a man. 
And this is important when we discuss the trigger for testing, because uh, at that time, there were no sex testing in place. All sex testing had been abandoned by the International Olympic Committee and uh, the International Association for Athletic Federation, which was renamed World Athletics um, in 2019. So Castor Semenes case uh, prompted an investigation into her um, gender and led to the <clears throat> 2011 IWF hyperandrogenism regulation. Now, these regulations are not available anymore on the web. So, if you look for them, you will not be able to find them because they were taken down after the suspension of regulation, which uh, came about in 2015. However, uh, they can be accessed from my research portal. So, the hyperandrogenism regulation or full title, the regulation governing the eligibility of females with hyperandrogenism to compete in women's competition, discuss what is it that makes a woman and a man for the purposes of sports competition. And they rely on two assumptions. The first one is that sex segregation provides fair participation to participants. And as we can read in the 2011 regulation, IWF writes, since 1928, competition in athletics has been strictly divided into male and female classification, and females have competed in athletics in a separate category designed to recognize their specific physical aptitude and performance. So sex segregation has been a necessary condition to ensure fair participation. And the second assumption is that testosterone is a master molecule of athleticism, or in other words, as the difference in athletic performance between males and females is known to be predominantly due to higher level of androgenic hormones, mainly testosterone and derivatives, resulting in increased strength and muscle development. And finally, and this is the crux of the matter, in my opinion, is that hyperandrogenism, elevated level of testosterone, constitute an unfair advantage. As we can read in the 2011 regulation, a female with hyperandrogenism, who is recognized as a female law, shall be eligible to compete in women's competition, provided that she has androgen levels below the main range of 10 nanomoles per liter, or if she has androgen levels within the male range, that she also has an androgen resistance, which means that she derives no competitive advantage from such levels. So the regulation for the first time required the pharmacological suppression of testosterone, also known as androgen deprivation, to a level of below 10 nanomoles per liter as a necessary condition to re-enter competition. So what do the regulations say in practice? They say that if you want to be a woman, one that is fair according to IWF to a fellow competitor, you need to have the right level of androgens either by nature or after androgen suppressive treatment. At that time, Castor Semena was not able to appeal. So when she competed again as a London 2012 Olympics, she competed under pharmacological suppression, although the details of the case have never been made public. This is some kind of the common knowledge about her case. She was not able to appeal because appeal in the world of international sports goes through the court for arbitration of sport and require a legal firm that supports you either working pro bono or most of the time uh, the athletes need to pay the expenses and of, and it's also the case as if the athletes end up losing the case, will have to pay the legal expenses also for the opponent. Skip forward to 2015, Duty Chand, an Indian sprinter, uh, 200 meter runners, was also targeted by the hyperandrogenism regulation, had a competing in the 2014 Commonwealth game. Now, uh, Duty Chand 
was able to appeal to the Court of Arbitration for Sport with the support of the Ministry of India. And here we can see some of the media from when she appealed in 2015. Her main argument was the following, that she wanted to compete with the body she was born with. I just want to run naturally the way I was born. It's not fair that I'm told I must change. It's not fair that people question who I am. Sorry, this is uh, Castor Semenya, but Tusi Chan used the same type of uh, uh, line that she wanted to compete with the body she was born and run naturally. So there is a, a opposition between levels of endogenous testosterone considered um, fair by the athletes and the level of exogenous testosterone, as in the case of uh, doping, which could be considered unfair. <clears throat> as I mentioned at the time of the when a duty child appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, she appealed against the 2011 hyperandrogenism regulation, which were based on perception as a trigger for testing. Perception means that if it is the way a female athlete looks like, that triggers a suspicion and a gender investigation. We've seen Elisa Kuzma Piccione say in 2009 that this kind of people should not run with us. And as a London Olympic, we've seen Maria Savinova, the Russian athlete, finish first as a London Olympics, where Semenya finished second, saying, just look at her. Obviously, she is different from us. To note that Maria Savinova's medal was later revoked on ground of doping. So Castor Semenya actually holds the London 2012 800-meter gold medal now. The language of the regulation has uh, not changed substantially from 1974, when femininity, femininity tests were in place that were carried out on women athletes taking part in the Olympic Games to make sure that all female athletes compete under identical anatomical condition. And these were tests looking at the anatomy of female athletes. In 2011, the purpose of the new policy is to guarantee the fairness and the integrity of female competition for all female athletes, where women should compete against alike. And again, this is uh, interesting. This table is taken from the original hyperandrogenism regulation, which were later suspended in the duty chain appeal, and clearly indicates uh, how perception can become a trigger for testing by identifying a scoring based on this table by Ferryman and Galloway on the basis of the um, amount and location of hair on the female athlete. Here's the TISM scoring. Duty Chand, the Duty Chand, the Indian sprinter appealing to the Court for Arbitration for Sport in Lausanne, Switzerland. This is the Supreme Court for Arbitration in Sport. This photo looks like a little castle uh, based in Lausanne. And uh, she was successful. She was successful in part. What does this mean? In uh, July 2015, CAS reached an interim decision, provisional decision. The CAS panel concluded that there was, at the moment, insufficient evidence about the degree of advantage the androgen sensitive hyperandrogenic females enjoy over non hyperandrogenic females, insufficient evidence. Uh, and on that basis, the hyperandrogenism regulation were suspended for two years. Later, this uh, amount of time was extended in order to provide the IWF the opportunity to provide cast with additional scientific evidence. The cast interim decision was a short-term success. It meant that in practice, duty Chand, Caster Semenya, and other athletes affected by hyperandrogenism could resume competition without having to take androgen suppressive therapy. 
However, it was a short-term success, and as I wrote in 2015, clear skies overhead, but clouds were looming on the horizon. Why? Because of the narrow grounds on which the suspension of the regulation had been granted by CAS, which paved the way for an appeal, as CAS had engaged only with empirical and not with a normative concern. CAS had bought into the IWF assumption that high level of endogenous natural testosterone, if demonstrated that there was a correlation between endogenous level of testosterone and performance advantage, this would also mean that the advantage was unfair. So what CAS decided in their interim 2015 decision was the IWF had not provided sufficient evidence and gave IWF additional time to provide that evidence. However, as I, among others, have noted, the case includes both empirical and normative concern. Empirical concerns about the magnitude or the degree of advantage over fellow athletes of athletes with hyperandrogenism, such as Caster Semenya. Empirical concern about the correlation between endogenous testosterone level and the performances. Empirical concern about the percentage of standard deviation of the final performance advantage conferred by high testosterone level over the final performance of other athletes. In terms of normative or conceptual concerns, concerns about fairness, we can outline the following questions. For example, is the performance advantage attainable? Is the performance advantage that Semenya, Duty Chan, and athletes with hyperandrogenism have? Is it attainable to other female athletes without that property advantage of high endogenous testosterone level? First question. Second question. In what ways is advantage conferred by testosterone similar or dissimilar to the advantage conferred by other genetic variations? And although an empirical analysis of the magnitude of the advantage conferred by testosterone is necessary, this is not sufficient for the adjudication of the case. And this has always been my argument, uh, together with the argument of other critical scholars. But the framing of duty chan case of, of the interim decision was too narrow, as it didn't set out to address the key issue. When does an advantage count as unfair. And let's look a little bit more at the notion of unfair advantage in sport. As a matter of fact, for all of us who are interested in sport and either are amateur athletes or just like to watch sport or TV or with friends, uh, when it's possible, advantages per se are not condemnable in sport. On the contrary, they are the essence of sport. However, some are considered fair and others are considered unfair. On which basis? And this is the, the crux of the matter. How can we discriminate an advantage that is fair for one that is unfair? Let's look at some other examples of performance advantages. And in this slide, I've listed through some images, others. At the center, you can see a photo of Finnish skier, Euro Mounty Ranta, from competing in cross-country skiing in the 1960s and 70s. On the top left, you can see Michael Phelps, the American swimmer who for many years was as, when he was at the top of his game was always winning gold medals and others swimming against him were only competing for a second place at the bottom left corner you can see Caster Semenya top right hand corner you can see Oscar Pistorius 
who was uh, his, his case um, about um, to the Court of Arbitration for Sport in 2008 requiring to compete uh, with able-bodied athletes also touches upon the issue of unfair advantage in sports, but this might be the topic for another time. And on the left um, um, right-hand corner, you can see the image of a genetically enhanced athlete. Um, now, with my Finnish uh, colleague and philosophy of sport, Mika Amalinehan, we have investigated the concept of fairness in sport um, and uh, building on uh, the concept of property advantage in sport, where property advantage is the advantage that is uh, conferred by a specific uh, genetic or biological uh, variation. We looked at uh, the 10 ways in which, according to the literature, in uh, philosophy and ethical sport, a particular advantage can be considered unfair. And in particular, since my co-author is Finnish and he was able to look and read into the Finnish literature, we look at the case of Eero Mantiranta. So Mantiranta is a fascinating story. He recently passed away in 2013. He was competing in cross-country skiing in the 60s and 70s and at the Innsbruck Olympics in 1964, he won two gold medals. He was affected by a condition known as genetic condition, primarily familiar congenital polycythemia, characterized by an elevated absolute red blood cell mass. This is a pathological condition with different degrees of severity, which leads to an increased oxygen carrying capacity because of, the, of an increased production of red blood cells, also known as erythrocyte. And indeed, it was estimated that in his case, his hematocrit level were about 60, which is an outstanding level of hematocrit, when increased up to 50% in the blood carrying capacity of his cells. Now, polycythemia is a genetic condition which is characterized as a pathology. Indeed, it can lead to symptoms such as hypertension, muscle pain, headaches, pain in the chest, and tinnitus, uh, blurry vision. And indeed, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, Mantiranta interviewed by sports journalist um, David Epstein uh, was described as somebody who, which it was uh, obvious from his appearance uh, that he was affected by a blood condition because of his ruddy complexion. There are other property advantages at the border of the physiological and pathological in sport. Um, in uh, NBA, uh, basketball players, uh, the condition known as uh, acromegaly with an increased production of the growth hormone also, which can have, uh, uh, has consequences for the athletes uh, as a higher prevalence in, in the normal population. Swimmer Michael Phelps has also been um, uh, suggested, as there was speculation, also this hasn't been um, confirmed, that he was affected by Marfan syndrome, a genetic condition that confers uh, an uh, exceptionally long uh, limbs uh, and uh, particular characteristics of uh, the ligaments. Now, my even without knowing whether Michael Phelps is or isn't affected by Marfan syndrome, obviously the length of his limbs put him as an outlier compared to the average as a general population. And this, I think, it's fair to say, is valid for all Olympic athletes insofar as they have genetic and biological variation, either known or unknown that makes them outliers and makes them the Olympic athletes, exceptional athletes that they are. Now, in the field of sports sciences, there is the branch known as genetic basis of sports performance, 
is uncovering um, every year more about the performance analysis single nucleotide polymorphism, also known as PEPs. These are uh, single nucleotide polymorphism that are correlated with performance advantage. For example, here's uh, as a nuclear factor erythrile like two gene has been identified as playing a role in endurance performance as it helps produce new mitochondria. And we know that the mitochondria are the energy producing organelles of our cells. And uh, athletes will have this variation have a reduced harmful effect from oxidation and inflammation and a faster recovery from training. A long list of performance enhancing polymorphism, this major candidate gene associated with other athletic performances can be found with a, a PubMed search into uh, genetic basis of sport performance. Um, <clears throat> these are natural variation. We also know that there are unnatural variation, which can be referred to as either gene enhancement or gene doping, depending on what kind of moral and ethical connotation you want to as, uh, associate to the technology. It might come as a surprise that already 15 years ago, in 2016, the very first product of gene doping came to the fore. And this was a, a product uh, in preclinical study to treat Fanconi anemia, a type of blood disorder, for a pharmaceutical company based in the UK. And uh, the product known as Repoxygen uh, for, was formed by a retroviral vector carrying the gene for human erythropoietin and aimed at having the same performance advantage that athletes like Mantiranta have um, naturally because they're affected by primarily familial polycythemia. And finally, the case of South African athletes, Caster, Semenya, and her hyperandrogenism due to a difference of sex uh, differentiation. So on what basis, this is a question I've been always interested in, on what basis can we single out testosterone from other biological and genetic advantages variation? According to the literature, we can do it through different criteria. One would be the natural and natural criteria. And this, among others, the word anti-doping view, which classifies gene doping as a, an unnatural way of enhancing performance and hence in, has included gene doping since 2006 in the list of prohibited substances. According to the natural and natural criteria, endogenous level of testosterone, such as those that um, Caster's men or duty chan have, could be considered natural and fair. Important to note that the uh, World Anti-Doping Agency does not adjudicate on matters of high testosterone level. It is a remit of the International Association for Athletic Federation, which was recently renamed World Athletics. Another way of distinguishing fair from unfair advantage is looking at the degree of advantage or as a magnitude of advantage. This was a line of thought uh, which was pursued by expert witness uh, Ross Tucker on behalf of Castor Semenya at the most recent appeal against the Court for Arbitration of Sport. Um, in 2018, Professor Ralph Tucker, on behalf of Semenya, analyzed the margin between first, second, and third place finishers in close to 600 World Championships and Olympic events, and concluded that Mr. Semenya's three most dominant victories ranked 11th, 14th, and 56th. Of these, two ranked outside the 95th percentile where none were outside the 99th percentile. By contrast, 
Usain Bolt had three margins of victory outside of the 99th percentile, with another two outside the 95th percentile. Hence, uh, responding to, if you remember my slide about the empirical and the normative and conceptual concerns, is the advantage conferred by testosterone obtainable by other athletes, female athletes in the category, the answer would be yes for Semenya. Well, for Usain Bolt, actually the answer might be no. And in fact, Ross Tucker, expert witness on behalf of Semenya, concluded that the, uh, on the basis of available data, whatever advantage does exist for Semenya does not put athletes like her with difference of sex differentiation in a position of insurmountable advantage. It's an advantage that is attainable by others, including those who are not affected by that condition. And this goes against what the IWF has been saying, that other female athletes need to be protected from athletes like Semenya. Along similar lines, but pursuing different examples, and based on his research, Professor Alan Williams for Genesis at University of Manchester, an expert witness at CAS on behalf of Semenya, compares the performance advantage derived by DSD mutation and the phenotypic effects of the alpha actinin 3 allele, which is also considered an acceptable performance advantage in sprinting and power events. As a matter of fact, Williams testified in court the athletes who possess the alpha actin in three allele are likely to sweep the podium in power and sprinting events. So, what's the difference between testosterone and other genetic and biological variations that confer an advantage? Going back to the question between the empirical and the normative concern. Well, according to Alan Williams and others, the only difference between testosterone and other biologic or genetic variation is that at the moment, it is not known which elite athletes have which advantages genetic variations. But as we start digging more and as we start looking more into the genetic basis for performance, let's say if we were to sequence all athletes, we would find out what genetic and biological variation, what performance enhancing polymorphism they have that makes them the exceptional athletes, the outliers that they are. Let's talk about the CAS hearings in February 2019. As a CAS hearings on February 2019, IWF President Lord Sabko testified. Today is a very, very important day. The regulations that we are introducing are here to protect the sanctity of fair and open competition. So reinstating the argument that regulations requiring androgen suppressive therapy are needed to ensure fairness in the female category. Protecting the female category, just look at her, was what Maria Savinova of Russia and Lisa Piccione of Italy had been saying. They also went a step further and said it's useless to compete with this and it is not fair. However, it is an empirical question whether the advantage conferred by testosterone is available and attainable to other female athletes in the category which are not affected by the difference of sex differentiation that Semena is affected by. And the data by Ross Tucker together with the data by Alan Willis and other experts pointing out that the degree or the magnitude of advantage conferred by other biological and genetic variation is actually of a greater degree than the advantage conferred by testosterone seem to point in the direction that this kind of argument is just wrong. 
competing for a second place. This is what fellow female athletes were complaining about. That it was unfair to compete against athletes like Semenya because they would always be competing for a second place. However, kind of zooming out from track and field to other sports, I already mentioned Michael Faust in swimming when at the top of his game, other athletes were definitely only competing for a second place. But also let's uh, take an example from gymnastics and Simon Biles, an article by the New Yorker in 2016, interview of the fellow athletes and uh, author wrote, all the girls are like Simon's in just her own league. Whoever gets second place, that's the winner. Ali Ransman, captain of the 2012 US Olympic team, said, is this unfair or is this just the way it is? I was telling you earlier that the grounds on which the 2015 CAS interim decision had been reached was a narrow ground in which CAS engaged only with the amount of scientific evidence available, but didn't question whether additional evidence brought forward by IWF could solve the issue of whether high testosterone level confer or not an unfair advantage. And indeed, the interim decision in the duty chant case was a short term success for athletes um, like uh, duty chant and Semenya. But as expected in 2018, IWF, after an extension on the two year suspension, came back with new regulations. New regulations that were at that time uh, more restrictive insofar as they require androgen suppression below five nanomoles per liter instead of below 10 nanomoles per liter but they only uh, pertain to a subset of events from the 400 meters to the mile so they didn't pertain to all events and track and field and they were in place from <clears throat> the end of April 2018. Castle Semenya and Athletic South Africa appealed to the Court of Arbitration for Sport against the new IWF regulation. It was a double appeal by two separate legal firms by Castle Semenya and by Athletic South Africa. During the duration of the appeal, the regulation were suspended it is important to note that the regulations were based on, in particular, one paper published in uh, 2017 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, authored by Stefan Bermon and uh, Pierre Yves Garnier, commissioned by the IWAF. And Stefan Bermon is the medical director of the IWF. And this is a point that was contested in court by expert witness Roger Pilke on grounds of an obvious conflict of interest. Again, you can see the Court of Arbitration for Sport in winter, the challenge brought by Semenya in June, and the regulation which were suspended for almost a year up to May 1st, 2019. A double challenge by Athletic South Africa and by Castor Semenya. The hearings were held in February 2019 at CAS. I was my co-author Simon Franklin at the London School of Economics and Jonathan Ospina Betancourt at the uh, University of Madrid submitted evidence in preparation to the appeal for the Norton and Fulbright legal firm working on behalf of Semenya. In our paper, published also in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, the direct response to the Bermon and Garnier paper, we provided a statistical reanalysis of the available data 
And our paper, among the papers of several other scholars, shows that the results contained in the Berman and Garnier paper were not replicable. There was a high likelihood of false pa positive. And the data are unreliable. We, among other, asked for the IWF to produce an entire set of data on which the paper was based, but they denied the refuse on grounds on confidentiality. But on the basis of the available data, the results and the conclusion contained in the article do not follow from the data. And hence, uh, there was a scientific agreement that, that the evidence submitted to court was not robust enough to support the new regulation requiring athletes with uh, hyperandrogenic levels to take androgen suppressive therapy to bring their hormones level down below five nanomoles per meter. It is important to note that there was at the time a scientific consensus on the fact that the evidence submitted by IWF was not robust enough. However, this is in very interesting for international sports regulation, for our critical analysis. The response by the Court of Arbitration of Sport was not, we don't agree that uh, the data are not robust enough, but they decided not to adjudicate the matter. So, they wrote, the question whether IWF creation and promulgation of DSD regulation meets the criteria for admissibility of evidence in court is not a matter which the panel considers it is required to determine in this case. The IWF must decide what is necessary and proportionate to achieve its aims on the basis of an honest and good faith that has a reasonable basis. And as long as that test is met, it is irrelevant that others may disagree with that view or my cite other contrary scientific evidence. I will reread it because I think it's really important. As long as the test of a honest and good faith basis for the regulation is met, Cass decided that it is irrelevant that other other scientists as the scientific community came forward and disagreed with the view of the IWF or cited contrary scientific evidence. Hence, Cass left an unprecedented degree of leeway to the IWF as international regulators regarding the type and the level of evidence produced and used to justify international policy. And this, I think, is really a lack of accountability on the grounds of the IWF, which was made possible by the decision of CAS, which, do not, was reached with a two out of three majority. That means that the panel composed of three judges was not able to reach a consensus. And with the two out of three majority, they decided to dismiss the Manias and that is South Africa appeal. Now, Roger Pielke, together with Ross Tucker, already mentioned, expert witness on behalf of Semenya and uh, director of the Center for Policy and uh, Integrity of Data, University of Boulder, Colorado, in his expert testimony at CAS, said he would not find it appropriate for cigarette companies to provide the scientific basis for the regulation of smoking or for oil companies to provide the scientific basis for regulation of fossil fuels. But this is what IWF did by commissioning scientific evidence, which was then submitted to courts and authors by the IWF medical director, Stéphane Bermont and co-author Pierre Garnier. The argument by Pilke, Tucker and others, including myself and my co-author, Simon Franklin, Jonathan Spina Betancourt, has always been the sports regulation should be held to the same high standard that we expect of researchers in other settings where science informs regulation and policy. 
but this currently is not the case. So I guess this is open for discussion. Made the release from May 1st, 2018, CAS with the decision up to three, this meets both requests for arbitration by either by Athletic South Africa and CAS Semenya and reinstated the regulation which are currently in place and will be in place for the Tokyo Olympics. Now, an open question is whether sports regulation should be held to the same standard of accountability and we expect in other settings where science informed regulation and where are the criteria of admissibility in court and where disagreement within the scientific community counts. And in this case, there was a consensus in the scientific community against the lack of robustness of the data. There are also medical ethics concern about the implementation of the regulation, which have been pointed out in the CAS ruling but CAS considered outside the scope of their decision. The World Medical Association came forward in April, just um, ahead of the press release, uh, urging, urging physicians not to implement the IWF rule on the basis that it is unethical for a physician to prescribe treatment for a condition that is not recognized as pathological and androgen suppressive therapy or deprivation therapy as known side effects. The World Medical Association calls on physicians to oppose or refuse to perform any test or administer any treatment or medicine which is not in accordance with medical ethics and which might be harmful to the athletes using it. Now this is really important because it, it pertained to the implementation, to the possibility of implementing regulation. And it was noted by Court of Arbitration for Sport. But again, the Court of Arbitration for Sport decided that they could only, they only, I guess, wanted to adjudicate on the good face of the regulation and the, on whether the scientific basis put forward by IWF was considered good enough. And this is an open matter also for the Olympics in 2021. Implications of Semenya's case going forward, what I've been calling the legacy, although now is the appeal to the European Court for Arbitration of Sport, uh, it might be part of her you know, ongoing professional career. Here in this slide, I outline the three implications. One, once we begin to unravel the genetic basis of sport performance, we open a can of worms or a Pandora's box for normative conceptual judgment of fairness of how to treat cases that in practice are alike, are the same. Androgen suppressive therapy is not the only way to level out to redress a perceived unfairness. The bar could be raised for everybody through genetic enhancement, or more categories could be construed. Semenya's case has shown an unprecedented degree of exceptionalism for IWF or World Athletics. And indeed, if we want to talk about the ways in which fairness could be achieved within a given category, these are three possible ways. We could level the property advantage down for everybody below a certain threshold through pharmacological means, but this has medical ethics implication and also would have to be done in a way that is consistent across different types of advantage that have the same degree of magnitude. Or we could level all these genetic advantages up, so raise the bar for everybody through some means of genetic enhancement. Or we create new categories. Now, the creation of new categories might seem far-fetched. It is something that bioethicists and philosophers of sport have been talking about for years. Fodin Savulescu in the UK, 
Lily Anderson and co-author in Australia and New Zealand have been proposing the creation of additional categories based on levels of testosterone. But it might be less far-fetched than one might think, including policymaker Stefan Bermond, director, medical director of the IWF and author of the main paper submitted as evidence for the new 2018 regulation. When speaking in personal capacity to The Guardian a couple of years ago, he said that he has a feeling that someday it will happen, that the additional categories will be in place. I concur with Claire Sarivan, writing for the Journal of Sports and Social Issues in 2011 about the myth of the level playing field. The fact is that playing field in elite sport has never been level. There will always be genetic variation that provide a competitive edge for some athletes over others. We readily accept the genetic athletic gifts that elite athletes possess without trying to find the level playing field. And I also concur with Alan Williams, expert witness on behalf of Semenya, a court for arbitration for sport in 2019, when he said that the only difference between testosterone and other property advantage is that we do not know what they are, while we know what advantage Caster Semenya has. If you want to read more, you can read the full arbitrate award, reductive form on grounds of confidentiality of names of other athletes with hyperandrogenism, which can be found at this link. Three arbitrators and uh, uh, judges uh, of which two out of three, we don't know which two out of three, <coughs> agreed on dismissing the appeal. Here are some key references from my work on this topic. I already mentioned my co-author, uh, Finnish, uh, uh, I was going to say skier, no, philosopher of sport, Mika Mahinean, also skier, but also my co-author, uh, uh, Simon Franklin and Jonathan Spina Betancourt, and when I was uh, earlier in my career, my co-author Paolo Maugerim. And uh, I conclude with this slide where I show ripples, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions and discussing the ripples of Castor Semenya's case for international sports regulation and beyond. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia, for a fascinating talk. Um, and thank you to the audience for such great participation. You're going to make my job very hard because there are a flurry of questions down below. Um, so apologies in advance if I don't get to all of them. Um, we're going to try to, I've got uh, um, Matt Jordan's helping me out, uh, collating some of your questions. I'll try to touch on some of the core themes that are raised. So even if I don't get to your exact question, hopefully um, I'll touch on a question that raises the issue that you are interested in. So but keep the questions coming. We'll keep an eye on them. And uh, now let's turn to some uh, Q&A. So um, one question that's uh, been voted up is the question of have any male athletes, uh, such as Usain Bolt, ever been tested for unusually high testosterone levels? And um, what would be the implications if they were excessively high? Uh, thank you, Jeff. Oh, I can hear it, Nico. Oh, and it, okay, I'm gonna go ahead unless I hear otherwise. So there is no um, equivalent ceiling on testosterone level in male athletes, and this is a point that uh, was highlighted by other critical scholars, uh, um, in addition to the work I've done. For example, in the UK, Vanessa Hagi, who is a historian of sport, um, uh, in her book, The History of uh, British Sports Medicine, has highlighted this point. What can happen? So there is no equivalent ceiling for levels of endogenous testosterone, natural testosterone. But, you know, the, in terms of um, anti-doping surveillance, uh, athletes get tested and uh, the levels of exogenous testosterone 
can count as a, a doping offense. But that uh, you know, raises a difference between what is endogenous and naturally produced by the body and what is administered externally to enhance performance. And the word anti-doping agencies includes uh, testosterone and uh, derivatives in the list of prohibited substances, and that can be account as a, as a doping offense. But in terms of ceilings on natural levels, there isn't an equivalent ceiling on ma male athletes. Great, thanks. So um, following up on that, um, another one that's been uh, voted up is whether or not you think there's a reason that testosterone levels are considered an advantage that requires intervention, but advantages such as arm spans have not. Um, and one um, audience member uh, wrote, writes, uh, surely the other uh, difference between testosterone and other property advantages is that we do split sports by sex, which is heavily linked to um, testosterone, but not, for example, arm span. Um, and so whether or not you think that, um, yeah, that that's a relevant issue. Different yeah, issues. definitely. This is, a, is a also a great question. And I think this a, is a contested point. I mean, arm span is an example. Uh, the person asking this question may have been thinking about um, uh, Michael, my example of uh, Michael Phelps. But in uh, the Court for Arbitration of Sport um, uh, hearings uh, uh, for Kasser Semenya and Athletics South Africa against uh, uh, World Athletics in 2009, this exact point about other advantages, biological variation, which can be biological in terms of arm span, length of uh, uh, no particular limbs or bones, but also genetic variation. And this was the example I was given, um, drawing on the work by sports scientist uh, Alan Williams, but also Ross Tucker, looking at the other um, genetic variation. And we know that because we study that and we investigate that, that elite athletes have a higher prevalence of this uh, genetic variation, but uh, they were not considered uh, unfair in the same way that testosterone is. And this is because of, um, I think, two reasons. One is a legal, legalistic reason. So critical scholars of legal studies have criticized the Court for Arbitration for Sport for narrowly adjudicating the case. And this is what I was talking towards the end of my presentation when I was saying that there's a level of discretion and accountability that the World Athletic has is unique, is exceptional in terms of the admissibility of evidence. And, um, and Court for Arbitration for Sport uh, only adjudicated on testosterone. And if you read, uh, as I've done, you know, the the 150 pages of, of the ruling, uh, which is the entire you know, uh, ruling, except for some uh, small redacted bits, you will see that they do talk about it and they do consider it a relevant argument, but they say it's outside the scope of this particular issue because they were asked to adjudicate only on testosterone. So they leave the door open to say, yes, there might be other advantages. In fact, we have heard from experts that the advantage of another athlete might even be higher in terms of magnitude of our degree, but we were not asked to adjudicate that. And the second point I think was raised by Jeff, you mentioned well, one of the questions in the audience talked about in reference to the fact that we do divide categories um, in terms of sex. So we consider sex segregation in athletics a necessary condition. And this again was something that was not challenged. So when we talk about ethics and philosophy of sport, um, we talk about, well, a solution could be created in different categories, but that's not what the Court of Arbitration for Sport did. They said, we're not going to discuss the creation of additional categories. We are going to, uh, to take for necessary the sex segregation. Great, thanks. Um, well, that actually links in very nicely with um, the next question I was going to ask. Um, but before we get to that, I want to check whether or not you got rid of your feedback problem, because I know how annoying that is. I think the solution would be to pause the live stream if you're still having that.
Do you still have the sound feedback, Sylvia? No, I can't hear the sound feedback anymore. So okay, good. Just I just know how distracting it is uh, to try to talk uh, when hearing one's own voice coming back. So anyway, to turn to the next question, which builds directly on um, your last comment, the question is, what do you think about the suggestion of completely eradicating sex segregation in sport and creating categories based on things like testosterone? Yeah. I mean, this is a, um, a fascinating suggestion, and I must say it precedes Castor Semenya's case. So as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, um, I've been working on, on the issue of regulating uh, female athletes with um, hyperandrogenism since the beginning of the case. But if you look at the philosophy and ethics of sport, you can find papers that precede 2009 that talk about the need to think outside the box and you know, get rid of sex segregation and think of different parameters. One could be you know, levels of testosterone, one could be levels of um, hematocrit. You know, if, you, if you think of uh, Monty Ranta example, I mean, he was really an exceptional athlete and this level of hematocrit definitely gave him an exceptional advantage over other athletes, an advantage that uh, had a higher degree of magnitude than Semenya. So one could say, well, athletes who have that particular condition need to be in a different category. So from a, a conceptual point of view, this is a fascinating point, definitely worth considering. Now, linking it back to what I was uh, saying in response to the previous question, this is an issue that was not considered by the Court for Arbitration of Sport. However, that doesn't mean it shouldn't be considered. You know, we should separate the fact that it hadn't been considered from the fact that going forward, it shouldn't be considered. In fact, I think I'm, I mentioned that even uh, uh, Stéphane Bermond, the World Athletics Medical Director and one of the main scientists working on behalf of World Athletics, uh, to submit evidence in support of the regulation, um, the report did talking to the Guardian a few years ago and in, um, in 2018, saying that he might see that as a possible policy evolution in the future, the fact that we might have more categories. So I definitely think it's important to, uh, to explore it. I'm not sure about the, the feasibility in practice, uh, but I think it needs to be contextual. So all of this discussion uh, is always about the context. So we're, now we're talking about, you know, track and field. And these are discussions about track and field. We're not, other discussions are happening in other sports. I mean, the construction of categories is, you know, the essence of sport. So I'm going to stop here. And, but, uh... Thanks. Um, so to maybe switch gears, we have some more questions that uh, revolve around some of those same themes, but I want to switch gears into a more legal oriented question, um, which receives some votes, which is, what are the legal arguments before uh, the European Court of Human Rights? I wish I knew. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I can um, make some um, educated assumptions. Uh, the same legal firm that uh, was working on behalf of Semenya, the Court for Arbitration of Sport in 2019, the Norton Rose and Fulbright is now um, working with Semenya for the recent appeal to the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and uh, I think an educated uh, assumption based on uh, the previous evidence and the fact that um, they're bringing it forward is that the, the appeal will be based on issue of discrimination against female athletes. Uh, for example, in, um, 2000, in the, at the end of 2018, while the, just before the hearings starting, the United Nations submitted a letter to World Athletics addressed to Lord Sebco, citing uh, evidence uh, actually based on the fact that there is no equivalent ceiling for male athletes. Um, so going back to the previous question, saying that this regulation had discriminatory against female athletes and their human rights to participate in sport with the body they are born with. So this brings us to the, the second point that I think, you know, it's, uh, will be part of the appeal. The fact that uh, Kassar Semenya or Duty Chand have always said, you know, I haven't been doping, I haven't been cheating, I've done nothing against 
you know, the spirit of sport uh, um, against the, the regulation. These are my natural level of testosterone. So one way of distinguishing an advantage that is fair from an advantage that is unfair is looking at whether it is natural or unnatural. And indeed, the Court of Arbitration of Sport, again, and I think that's why the case is so interesting and has so many ripples, the Court of Arbitration for Sports recognizes, uh, at the beginning of the ruling, that Caster Semenya did nothing wrong. She's not a, a cheater, she didn't dope. But we were asked to adjudicate, and with a two out of three majority, which also is an issue worth discussing, they reached the decision to, to dismiss um, the appeal, but they note that there are many problems. The, the implementation of the regulation, this is the third and final point, uh, which I think would be part of the appeal, is the fact that the World Medical Association has come forward strongly advising um, physicians and medical doctors against implementing the regulation on grounds that are contrary to the principles of medical beneficence because they require the pharmacological suppression of testosterone absent any therapeutic benefit to the athletes. So in a sense, the regulations are still in place, but they might not, might not be ethical to implement them. Great, thanks. Actually, that um, links in uh, directly with another question. But actually, before I get to that, maybe I'll just follow up. Somebody wrote, I think, a follow-up question on the the, um, the, the the court case and whether or not you have a clear view on the human rights implications and whether or not there's going to be competing and conflicting rights so that proportionality would be key. That's, the question. That's a very good question. Um, I think the human rights angle, in my opinion, is not going to be successful as a defense because uh, athletes in general, professional athletes, when they enter into um, competition, they have to give away other rights that we consider fundamental, the right to privacy. I mean, speaking of doping, if a particular athlete uh, is not found at the site of a random doping evaluation, that is considered a doping offense. So, you know, there are many ways for something to count as a doping offense. It's not only the fact that a prohibited su substance is found in an athlete's blood, but also the fact that an athlete was not um, uh, to be found at a random doping test. So the athlete renounces the right to, to privacy, which we consider you know, one of our human rights on condition of entering competition. So I think on the taking the side of world athletics, I could say if you're a professional athlete, so you are renouncing other rights and these are the rules of the game. And we decide the rules and you decide whether to compete with these rules or not. Um, however, I think a more successful line of uh, reasoning for Semenya is uh, twofold. Is the fact that yes, she has an advantage, but it's not insurmountable. In fact, it's attainable to other female athletes in the category, even those who do not have the particular condition. We know now, thanks to the science, and this is where the comparative element needs to come in. We know that there are other genetic variation and biological variation that confer a higher degree of an advantage. So then the question is, okay, do we, do we only consider testosterone unique because of we sex segregate and we consider that a necessary condition? And finally, I think a very successful line of argument is the line of the World Medical Association. This regulation, if you talk to medical doctors and physicians, they will tell you that the side effects um, of androgen deprivation or androgen suppression therapy are manifold and, uh, and they're not justified if there is a therapeutic rationale. So I think this would be my opinion, but I, I'm curious to see how that unfolds uh, and also the human rights angles, how it plays out. Great. So I'm going to now um, sort of go back to where you ended uh, your last answer. Uh, you started talking about the role of the medical professionals. And uh, one question is this, should medical professionals be allowed to prescribe uh, hormone suppressants purely for sporting reasons, high testosterone level, 
isn't an illness? That's another great question. Okay, so in um, so I work on the ethics and law in sports and medicine, and uh, in uh, in this context, the sports physician are often found themselves between uh, uh, a rock and a hard place, so to say, because they are responding to the athletes towards whom they have a duty to care and to treat, but they also responding to um, other interests in professional sports, uh, the interest of a faster return to play, for example. So we do see in the context of medicine and sports issues of conflict of interest for the sports physician who is at the same time um, may have conflicting um, obligation. Now, I think in terms of medical ethics, one would say the priority goes towards the health of the athletes, not towards the faster return to play and let's fix these athletes uh, uh, as soon as we can so that they can return to play with consequences and in terms of long-term health of the athletes. But we see this in other contexts beyond track and field, you know, the example of repeated concussions or injuries uh, and the use of uh, particular um, uh, cort corticosteroids to, uh, to allow um, a swifter return to play. So this is not unique in the context of uh, medicine and sport. I think the answer is no, they should not be allowed. But I wouldn't be surprised if uh, some did prescribe that. And uh, I think uh, there needs to be clear regulation coming from the top. So this is world athletics. If we're speaking about athletics, that this should not be possible. Of course, this world athletics says these are the regulation. They are implicit in saying that doctors should be allowed to, to do that. And that's uh, the legal issue that I hope that the European Court of Human Rights can uh, help uh, solve. Great, thanks. Um, so we've had uh, quite a few questions um, sort of linking this case to questions about uh, transgender. And um, so to pick up on a couple of those, um, one is, would you, the question is, um, would it be fair um, for a trans female uh, who remained entirely biologically male to compete as a woman uh, another related question is how do you distinguish this case from a sports ethics perspective from uh, issues of trans rights? Yeah. Okay, so this is also a very, both questions are great question and very complex. So I must say, let me just um, answer saying when uh, the Castor Semenya play the case or duty chan, the issue of hyperandrogenism has only recently been linked to the issue of transgender athletes. And this was an explicit legal move on uh, from the um, IWF, the World Athletics uh, team, from their lawyers uh, in the most recent um, case to the Court of Arbitration for Sports. For example, in the Duty Chand case, uh, there was no mention whatsoever of what are the implications for transgender athletes. It was only a question of, we have athletes with hyperandrogenism because of uh, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or difference of, differences of sex differentiation, and how do we regulate that? Do we even need to regulate it at all? In the, most, in the 2019 case, we've seen a, basically a change of tactic on, the, on part of the legal team working for World Athletics who have brought in this argument of pre protecting the female category. That was, you know, Sebco, Lord Sebco quote about, we need to protect the sanctity of female competition. We need to, to protect fellow competitors for people from athletes who are like Semenya. And we need to protect the female competition because if we don't regulate those athletes, we're gonna have, uh, the female category flooded in by transgender male to female athletes. And uh, I think that was a, um, a very smart ta tactical legal move, but uh, it's conceptually wrong because it conflates two issues which are quite different. Here we're talking about hyperandrogenism that is not for transgender athletes. And then we have the issue of transgender male to female athletes 
who may at some point uh, want to compete in the female category and that is regulated uh, answer to answer the question because I don't want to say I've evaded the question no I, I shouldn't I wouldn't say that they should be allowed to compete in the female category if they remain male in that because the issue of um, how the categories um, are built is that within each category athletes with similar biological uh, makeup and talent should have a fair equality of opportunity to win but we shouldn't open the category so that it to be as inclusive as possible uh, but i've always said these two things should be kept separate from a regulatory and policy and conceptual point of view the fact that they haven't uh, was a legal um, uh, tactic used in the most recent case, which I must say somehow successfully brought the debate to we need to protect the female category from the fear of uh, uh, the category being flooded with male to female transgender athletes. But I, I don't think that will be the case. Thanks. Um, so to switch gears again, we've had a few questions um, basically asking for your views on maybe what motivates the uh, sort of the, the controversy here. Um, maybe this is slightly more of a sociological question than, a, than an ethical one, but a few people have asked it, so I'll uh, pass it on. So, um, you know, one version is, uh, given the prevalence of biological advantages in athletes, do you think it is the gender element that causes the controversy around uh, Semenya? Yeah. Likewise, another uh, question is, why is Semenya being scrutinized so harshly? Is it somewhat related to her race and sexuality? Would the same happen to a straight white woman? Yeah. So, I know this might be going beyond the bounds of your no, expertise, no, no. but the audience wants to know, so. Sure. No, I love the sociological angle and I, all, all, okay. So I'll try to answer both in turn. First of all, I also wonder myself, what is the drives world athletics? Uh, so, fiercely to wanting to regulate, because I never thought when I started to work and do research in this area, that after 11, 12 years, we would still be talking about this. I thought that some, no, honestly, I thought after the duty chant case that they would drop the ball, okay? And uh, this is my personal opinion, but if you read, again, carefully, the Court for Arbitration of Sport, which I think is fascinating and full of, uh, uh, you know, um, there's so much in there for critical scholar coming from sociology, science and technology studies, gender studies or legal studies to unpack their ruling beyond the fact that they dismiss the appeal. So one thing that they say is that we're not, we're not asked to adjudicate whether uh, regulation were needed in the first place. So they leave it because we were asked to adjudicate whether additional evidence was sufficient to reinstate the regulation. But you now reading between the lines, one can say, were regulation needed at all? Because we're talking about a handful of athletes. Uh, we're talking about a huge investment in terms of uh, funds, uh, visibility, um, in terms of the organization itself. So the organization, which is the World Athletics, has been spending so much energy since the past 10 years on this case. And one asks, what is it that drives them? I don't know. Um, it would be curious to do some empirical research if they're ever happy to, to speak honestly about this. Uh, the second angle has been um, written about by many fantastic scholars around the world coming from the Global South, I mean, Castor Semenya being South African, just to give you an example, when, when her case first came to the fore in 2009, we were also talking about another South African athlete, white male, that was Oscar Pistorius. And we were talking about unfair advantage, the same issue. We were talking about whether Pistorius competing with uh, able-bodied athletes with his cheetahs prostitutes had an unfair advantage over them. And then we were talking about Castor Semenya competing with her high level of testosterone, whether she had an advantage over female fellow athletes. And the two cases were treated and framed in a very different ways um, and by the media. So from a sociological point of view, yes, definitely I think that race and gender um, 
played a big role. I'm not a gender scholar or a post-colonialist scholar myself, but for those interested, there is a lot out there that looks at the issue from, from that angle. And also from the fact that other athletes um, uh, that have been targeted by the regulation have always been athletes from the global south. So there haven't been white uh, uh, female athletes targeted by this regulation. I think I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation uh, perception as a trigger for testing. We was dropped in the most recent iteration of the regulation because it was um, considered problematic, but still it, it's there. Okay, great. Thanks. I think we are amazingly coming um, close to the end of our time. So with apologies to those who asked questions that I've not gotten to. Um, I hope that I've uh, at least touched on the core theme that you were interested in, even if I didn't get to your particular question. Uh, maybe we'll end with just a sort of general question, which is um, whether you think Semenya will ever get justice. Ooh, this is a difficult question. Uh. Uh, I wish I could say, yes, I think she will get justice through the European Court of Human Rights. Um, I, I must say I was wrong in my past uh, prediction when I thought that the uh, Court for Arbitration for Sport was, would not dismiss uh, uh, the appeal, but they did with a two out of three majority, which I think it's I say, also problematic in itself. I'm not sure that she will get justice. I think a professional career in track and field uh, is uh, coming to the we'll say sunset because uh, she's already 30 or, or 31 going towards 31 year old and uh, but I think she will get justice in, in a broader way. I hope that um, the European Court for Human Rights can really point to all the issues which have been left out by the Court for Arbitration for Sport deciding to adjudicate in such a narrow way only about the evidence of testosterone and whether it was sufficient. So I hope that they will discuss all the other issues, the ripples that were noted by the Court for Arbitration for Sport, but they said it's not for us to adjudicate. So I will not, I'm not going to make a prediction and I, maybe we can, uh, I look forward to, to see how it unfolds. I'm sure we all do as well. And uh, thanks to your very illuminating talk, we will all have much deeper thoughts on it than we otherwise would. I know, speaking from personal experience, I've always found this to be a very hard issue to get my head around. And so your talk and your comments tonight really helped clarify some of the, the key issues for me. So um, I should maybe now move into my thanks. So maybe I'll start by thanking you uh, myself for, um, you know, uh, and also thank you uh, on behalf of the audience uh, for giving such an illuminating talk. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks to the uh, audience. <laughs> uh, I'd secondly, like to thank um, the Delancey and Delahanty Foundation uh, for making this uh, event possible. Uh, third, we'd like to thank uh, Venue AV for facilitating the technological wonders of Zoom and interfacing with the interface and the well just making everything work behind the scenes I don't even really know what happened but I trust that it all went smoothly on your end uh, it went smoothly for us here so thank you to venue AV and finally uh, thank the audience for uh, great participation really excellent questions um, it was uh, difficult to keeping up with all of them um, but they uh, really I think further uh, clarified some of the key issues for me so on that note, I suppose I would normally say join me in um, thanking, but maybe we can just all uh, virtually clap or, or do whatever. And uh, yeah, have a, have a great night. Thanks for making time to join us this evening for the Baron Delancey Lecture. Thank you.